What's going on, everybody? My name is Steve Gum, and you're listening to the Make Your Mark podcast, where we focus on creating breakthroughs in business and in life. Today, I'm proud to bring to you a buddy of mine, someone I admire uh, for many different reasons, Jason Gaynard. And this is a guy who has built a seven-figure business, a traditional business, not your internet marketing or info marketing type of a business. And you know his, his background is so similar to mine in what happened. Um, His business had some issues, he self-sabotaged a little bit, he goes into it here in the interview, but ultimately ended up losing that business and ended up about a quarter million dollars in debt. And if you've never been in that type of a situation, it is not fun. Let me just put it that way. But this is a guy that is so focused on self-improvement and moving forward, the pace at which he picked himself back up and the risks he took during the period of that loss to to creating what is now Mastermind Talks is really fascinating. And, you know, this is a guy that's just very authentic. What he's doing, I love. I mean, check out Mastermind Talks. I'll have this in the show notes at makeyourmark.com slash 14 as in episode 14. He's doing so many really, really cool things, and I hope you enjoyed this interview. Um, So, yeah, with that being said, let's go ahead and uh, get to talking with Jason. Uh, Welcome to Make Your Mark, man. Dude, I appreciate you having me on. I hope I live up to that intro. Well, I mean, I, I could have really, I, we, we could have gone crazy. I mean, if you want, you know, we can we can dive deep on an intro here. I won, I won most improved award. Yeah. Third, third, third year of hockey. So. <laughs> well, I guess for you, you know, I'm going to, and I was telling you beforehand, I'm going to redirect people definitely to, to all your stuff so they can kind of get the, the overall story because I do sure. think it's fascinating. And, and for me, and I've shared a little bit of, of this on, on my podcast of, of how I self-sabotage and, and kind of tank the business myself, but you've got a unique story. And again, um, can you just give us a, a high level, so to speak, of, of, you know, where you've come from and how you got to the point where, you know, now the evolution of Mastermind Talks? Yeah, sure. So, uh, really, really quickly, I uh, I dropped out of high school. Uh, I started a service based business. I realized that service based business is hard to scale. I uh, pivoted into an online product business, which I grew to about six million dollars a year over four years with no outside investments. Uh, that was actually in the ticketing space, so selling and reselling concert tickets and sporting event tickets and stuff like that. Um, and I got to a point I was living the whole four hour work week. That was the dream at the time. That's what that my that was my goal. Um, and uh, it, it was nice for a little bit. With but with all that money and all that free time, I started to ask myself questions like, Why am I here? Will I be remembered? How many people show up to my funeral? And I was simply not happy with the answers I was giving myself. And uh, around that time, I realized I was also I was making twenty two times the national average income. And in you know business circles that would be celebrated but it was bothersome to me because I'm not I'm like I'm not 22 times happier than the average male I'm not 22 times healthier when two years prior to that when I was 23 I had kidney complications because of stress so consciously I want to sell the business and I told people I was selling the business uh, but subconsciously I started to sabotage it and drive it into the ground and I just started from that. As soon as I made that decision, I started disconnecting from the business. Uh, and it was, I mean, there was a lot uh, that, that that to take into account as to why we we went down. But I mean, it was a death by a thousand paper cuts. I had some people within the business that were not great hires. Um, so when I removed myself, they were kind of like a cancer from within the business. Yeah, yeah. And I was totally cool with that after a while because I wanted nothing to do with the business. And was completely fine with uh, scaling it down to zero. Um, and then two things happened beyond my control on the way down that landed me a quarter million dollars in cash debt, which was August of 2012. So, um, I was quarter million dollars in debt, had no, <laughs> had no business, no cash flow, And that's probably one of the scariest parts, you know, especially somebody like you who's built a big business before, um, having, you know, sometimes a million dollars a month coming through your business and that's stopping, uh, is nothing short, but, <laughs> but terrifying. <laughs> so, um, but the, the scariest part was of that whole situation was that I, like most entrepreneurs, I built my business at the expense of my health. And uh, I just always focused on the business and that kind of stuff. And I ended up 72 pounds heavier than I am now. Wow. And I knew I had the mental capacity to put myself out of a quarter million dollars in debt because it sounds a lot to a lot of people. But when you've built, you know, eight, a seven, eight figure business before, you know, 250,000 isn't a ton of money. So I knew I had the mental know-how to come up with a business. And, you know, I knew I, my limiting beliefs weren't going to keep me from that. So I knew I could do it, but I had no energy. Um, 
So it was like having a Ferrari for a brain with no gas in the tank. And that was the scariest part because I had to get my health back on track before anything else. So that was my focus for the first little bit. And then, so August, that's August, 2012, September 1st, my daughter turned six months old. Uh, I got married on September 1st. Wow. So there was a lot, there was a lot going on. But uh, uh, the following month in October, somebody gave me a ticket to go see Seth Godin in New York. So somebody in my network posted it on Facebook and they're like, hey, I have an extra ticket for this event if anybody wants it. Um, and at the time I wasn't up to anything in particular. So I was checking Facebook every few minutes to stay, you know, procrastinating as much as I could. <laughs> and, uh, I ended up saying, I'll take the ticket and, uh, didn't know what it was about, but I've always been a huge fan of sets and I've never had an opportunity to actually see him live. So, uh, I took it, I went to his workshop, which was called the connection economy and how there's huge value connecting like-minded individuals. And at the time I'm like, there's no group as disconnected as entrepreneurs because everybody's working in their own businesses and that kind of stuff. So I started doing these things called mastermind dinners where I'd invite six to eight entrepreneurs out for dinner with the hopes of getting them to connect and that kind of stuff. And the first one I did, I almost canceled two hours prior because I'm like, nobody's going to see value in this. They're going to think I wasted their time. But thankfully, I went through with it. And during that dinner, I mean, that was the first time in a long time that I lost track of time. And that to me was an indication that connecting entrepreneurs or being in that environment was something I want to do to some capacity for the rest of my life. Not necessarily as a business, but just you know, maybe continue doing these dinners. And I wasn't profiting from these dinners either. I wasn't charging for them. So I was spending, you know, five to seven hundred dollars a dinner. Um, and I was already a quarter million dollars in debt. So I was using whatever little credit I had left. But and in hindsight, it's it it sounds crazy and it, you know, it it is. Uh but <laughs> My reasoning at the time was that the bank could take my car, they could take whatever measly assets I have left, but they can't take my relationships. So investing in myself and investing in my relationships were the two safest investments I could make because I was considering bankruptcy at the time because I'm like, I don't know what's going to happen in the next few months. So I kept on with these dinners. A few months later, I had an opportunity to do an event with Tim Ferriss. Tim is somebody I've known for the past three years. And I jumped at the opportunity. Um, because I saw it as, uh, as a chance for me to do what I do in these dinners, but on a larger scale. So instead of having six to eight entrepreneurs, I could have 120. Um, and my goal was it was purely social capital. That was the plan. It was to simply break even. And I knew if I could put 100 amazing entrepreneurs in a room, I just added 100 amazing entrepreneurs to my network. Um, and uh, thankfully, you know, from, from the time I, I pulled the trigger on Tim, and started planning out the event to the time I actually got on stage during our first event. I mean, we we pivoted probably 180 times, wow. but it uh, thankfully was a huge success. Um, I was just planning to do the one event, but because it was a huge success, I decided to do it again. And the second event was June of this year, 2014 in Toronto, and that was another success. So I'm like, I'm on to something here. So uh, we have our third event planned in uh, in April in Napa. So uh, I'm officially in the event business. Dude, it's so awesome. That's what I was going to ask you. Did you have like any history put, you know, like like for me, if I decide to put on an event tomorrow, that sounds crazy. You know, I, I mean, it sounds like a very complicated thing. Did you have any like know-how in that space? No, I, I said it at, uh, at the first Mastermind Talks event that ignorance and confidence can go a long <laughs> way when you're an entrepreneur because I, I had absolutely no clue. Wow. I mean, I've been to many events, so I, was, I could use that as a reference point. But I mean, I, I mean I, there's a saying that conventional methods yield conventional results. And because of the situation I was in and because I didn't have experience in, in events, it forced us to be – uh, rather unconventional. So we don't pay our speakers, which is unconventional, unless you're like Ted. Uh, instead, we put up a $25,000 prize for the best talk as voted by the audience. We have a super, super rigorous application process. And you can't even, you know, truth be told, our second event, we didn't even open it up to the general public. Wow. So we had people who applied and stuff like that, but the, the event was already filled because we only have 120, 140 spots. Um, there's a, a ton of stuff. I refunded forty three thousand dollars in paid tickets for the first event because of people I thought they were not the right fit, um, and I didn't know if this high level curation would pay off, but it, it did, and it, and that's why it's it's such a an exclusive event that the people enjoy. And there's a lot of chatter about it. People talk about it all the time, uh, and we don't do. I I haven't spent. I spent a little bit. I spent about probably two thousand dollars on Facebook marketing, Facebook ads for our first event. Um, 
and since then we haven't spent a penny on advertising. No kidding. So, yeah. so your your first event, uh, th that's basically what you did to market the thing. So what what we did was um, a lot of the speakers we had. We had a really great list of speakers for our first event. I was very very grateful. How, how'd you get, uh, how'd you get this how'd you get the speakers? Because I mean, you're basically coming out of left field. Like, hey, I'm gonna sure I'm gonna, I'm gonna launch yeah. mastermind and, talks. And from a, a speaker's perspective, it's huge risk right. for them to come speak to an event, especially for free. Even if it wasn't free, because they don't for a first time event. There's no there's no proof, right? There's no right, right. Uh, they, they could get there and there could be nobody in the room. It could be you know half full. It could be filled with a different type of audience than what they were expecting. Like nobody knows. It could be AV issues. Like <laughs> you know, there's the. I mean, now that we have a track record, we have that brand equity. It's it's a piece of cake. But back then, it was a huge risk for them. So I'll always put those those speakers who took that first step on a pedestal because they you know they helped us out tremendous tremendously. But Immensely, sorry. But uh, I mean, the secret sauce to it, I mean, I had weak kind of ties with all of them. I wasn't super close with many of them, but I had some, I had my foot in the door from kind of previous things. So they knew we knew each other on a first name basis. Um, and the real kind of secret sauce to it um, is I knew if I had Tim, who's a pretty big name, he's a three, yeah. three time New York Times best selling author, I knew if I had Tim. Mm -hmm. I could get people who wanted to be connected to Tim to speak, or I could get people who are already connected with Tim, but they want the, but they're never at the same place at the same time. So I could use Tim as that anchor or that catalyst to kind of draw in the right people. Um, and I was very strategic as far as who I invited because by the time the event happened, the majority of the speakers knew everybody there as far as the other speakers are concerned. So it was just kind of like this big meetup. Um, and that's why the speaker stayed for the entire two days of the event and stuff like that. It's a, it's a very different type of event. Um, but that was kind of the secret sauce as to how we pulled them in initially. And then for our second event, it was much easier because, uh, again, we had that brand momentum. And then the third event's going to – well, third event's going to be a piece of cake. Um, I mean, we're, we're in a position now where our last event, we were considering 120-something speakers for 13 spots. This this time around, I think we have a list of like 175 thus far, and again, we'll probably have less spots this time, probably like 10 spots. Wow. Um. So it's a it's like a paradox of choice. It's a good problem to have, but it's a problem nonetheless because you never know <laughs> who the right speaker is. But uh, it, it's definitely more of an art than a science. But that's how we did it for our first event. I mean, that's pretty crazy. Do you, do you look back now? I mean, at what has evolved? Because this is you know what I mean. A year been, and a year and change. May 2013 was our first event. Yeah, I mean, you've got to look at that. Uh, going from you know uh, what happened with your previous business that that year. I mean, do you ever just kind of go, what what the hell happened? How did I pull this off? Yeah, I mean, it's. It, I mean, as as entrepreneurs, we're always kind of forward looking, and you know, we're never that good at celebrating our wins um, and that kind of stuff. And you know, we often. We often overestimate what we can accomplish in a day, but underestimate what we can accomplish in a year. Yeah. And yeah, I mean, looking back now, uh, it's easy to say, yeah, I mean, I, I've definitely covered a hell of a lot of ground. My per <laughs> my, my, my personal brand has, has grown immensely. Like I was a nobody before, and I don't want to say I'm a somebody now, but through association with all these best-selling authors and all these big-name speakers, I have a pretty great – uh, tribe of my own. Uh, Mastermind Talks as a brand has great brand equity. We've pre-sold half of our next event um, just through people who attended our last event. We only allow usually a third of people, to, uh, a third of the people, to come back. So we filled up those spots for next year's event, and we haven't announced the speaker yet. We haven't announced the location, um, any of that kind of stuff. So yeah, I mean, what we're doing now in that space, it takes some people years to do, or sometimes they never they never even attain it, um, because in the event space, it's it, it, rule of thumb is you, it takes four events to break even, and our first event broke even, our second event made money, and our third event's going to make a lot of money. Wow. I mean that, that that's that's fantastic, man. And, and you know the reason is you know you did it um, in a unique way. But I mean, as entrepreneurs, I mean we've been to, I mean I've been to you know more events than I can count. And, and I think you know the, the strategy of of um, you know staying small but high quality is you know you've kind of uh, really carved out something unique there. Um, and that's probably why you're seeing demand go through the roof and you're turning people away. I mean, it's one of those things where when you can't get in and you know it's damn good, everybody wants in. Yeah, well, I mean, and, and the, the question, the, the you know, the hard time, the hard thing we had to overcome initially was what is what is quality? How do you rate people? 
because we were just talking about it offline about like organizations like the entrepreneurs organization. It's a great organization. Uh, you know, they have 10,000 members, which is, which is fantastic, all that kind of stuff. But it, it, when your benchmark is your business has to do X, Y, Z, as far as a figure, right. um, it isn't always the best benchmark. Um, so I knew that in going into mastermind talks, but at the same time, I had a hard time really identifying, like I knew a baseline, every, everybody had to be an entrepreneur. That was the absolute baseline. And, but then you start questioning yourself, well, what's an entrepreneur, right? When you think of like me, at least when I was thinking of the word entrepreneur at the time, I was thinking of it in the traditional sense or like somebody with traditional overhead and staff and all that kind of stuff. But at the <laughs> same time, I know people who just have a laptop and you know, they can work anywhere in the world and they do three, $4 million a year, uh, relatively passively. Right. So, um, I, you know, I had to be a little flexible on that. So I had a very tough time with that. But what I did was I went through every single application one by one. Our first event had 4,200 people apply. I went through every single application one by one. And the people who I thought were a good fit, I send them an invite. When they purchase a ticket, I'd hold a phone call with them. And to date, there hasn't been a single person who's been to our events that I haven't had a phone call with in advance. And during that phone call, I'd find out where they are, where they want to go, and if the event would truly help get them there quicker. Because if it was, if I didn't feel like they'd get value from the event, at least like 10x return, then they're probably not a good fit. But at the end of every phone call, I'd ask myself, and this was the tiebreaker, at the end of every phone call, I'd ask myself, would I want to have dinner with this person? And if the answer was no, I didn't care how big their business was, I'd refund their ticket. Wow. And the best part was is that after our first Mastermind Talks event, one of the testimonials that somebody left us was that Mastermind Talks felt like a two-day-long dinner party in good company. And I'm like, that's the best testimonial I could possibly ask for. And it's, <laughs> and it's ironic because that's the question and the process I went through as far as vetting people. So – you know, at our events, we have you know business leaders, New York Times bestselling authors. Um, also, we have some people who are more startup ish, but they're really, really promising, um, and they're just all amazing, amazing people. And um, yeah, there's there's no science to it; it's more of an art. So the next question is, well, how do you scale that? That I, I'm not necessarily sure, but at the same time, given that I built a business before that was very financially rewarding and unfulfilling, like <laughs> remotely, like not even remotely fulfilling. Um, now, instead of scaling revenues, I'm really focused on scaling impact. And I don't want to, I don't have the desire to grow this up to be a hundred million dollar business, a $50 million business. If I can do one event a year and every year raise the bar as far as the experience for the people in the room, and I'm able to provide for my family, Man, that's that that's all I need. Yeah, and, and you know, I mean, even on your website, you've got some great stuff on there just to kind of get into to your head. But I mean, you you have, you know, not to get through all the quotes, but you know, you talk about valuing legacy over currency, and, mm -hmm. and man, if that's something that you, you know, because we were talking about our kids uh, before we started the podcast, and it's one mm -hmm. of those things where like if I can ingrain that in my kids, it, it it's just like. It's one thing I think as entrepreneurs, and I don't know why that is, unless you have that guidance as you know, as a youth to kind of take that type of uh, mentality, it's so financially driven that you end up, because I was in the same boat as you. I mean, I had a business that, I mean, I, I dreaded it, you know, and then I ended up self-sabotaging. It sounds very similar to what, what you went through, Jay. Yeah. And, and so, I mean, just the idea of what you're doing and, and you know, scalability almost as a secondary like if we can get there great but you know you're really focusing on this this legacy and this quality and i just uh it's, it's refreshing you know well I, I i appreciate it i mean it's it's one of those things like my first business i got into the first business based you know the kind of the traditional model like you pick your business based on proximity and opportunity right and you know, oftentimes the business picks you and you don't pick the business. And one exercise I did when I was down and out to a degree, which I'm forever grateful I did it because if it wasn't for that exercise, it's quite possible I would have ended up in another business financially successful and still unfulfilled was this exercise called the perfect day. Uh, Cameron Harold, who's a well-known speaker in EO, has something called Vivid Vision, I think he calls it now, or yeah. Painted Picture. Yeah. Um, somewhat around the same process. There's a few people who have different names, but the 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 philosophy is simple. Cameron's is more kind of business-oriented, but the one I, I, I did was 
basically, if you think about it, business, the core function of business is to make money. Um, now, obviously, impact and philanthropy and all that stuff is, is great, but the core function of business is to make money. core function of money is to perpetuate experience in our day-to-day -day lives on some level, right? That's the reason we, we want to make money so we can have a, a house, we can have provide for our kids, all that kind of stuff. So if that's kind of the, the process of things, the next logical question is, well, what do we want our day-to-day -day life to look like? And so I mapped out my day, like my perfect day, like where am I waking up? Who am I waking up next to, which is my wife in this case? Uh, what time am I waking up? Am I going to an office? Am I working from home? What time do I start work? How long am I working? Not necessarily what the business is, but how much time am I devoting to work? You know, what am I eating? Who am I spending my time with? Uh, how often are we going on vacations, that kind of stuff. And got really crystal clear on that. And once I was clear on that, when opportunities started to come my way, I could ask myself, is this going to take me closer to my perfect day or is it going to take me further away? And if it was going to take me further away, it was an easy no. It was non-negotiable. And if I knew it was going to take me closer to my perfect day, um, then it was worth considering. And you know, it's, it's one of those things that oftentimes we get stuck in this like entrepreneurial hamster wheel where we build a business we hate to enable us to buy things we don't need to impress people we don't even like. And we just stay on it. And thankfully, it, for me, I, I haven't found too many entrepreneurs who've, who've had this kind of strike of enlightenment without hitting rock bottom. It's, it seems like there's, there's something that has to happen drastically to their health or somebody's health for them to get or, you know, their business crashes and burn, uh, burns in order to get this kind of enlightenment that, hey, you know, why am I doing this <laughs> and really start focusing on the things that truly matter. Yeah, yeah, totally. And, and that kind of helps me uh, transition because I was going to ask you some of this, like when, you know, and, you, and you're the type of guy, I mean, I know enough now where like habits and some of these things are a critical component of, of what you do. I mean, were you like that before uh, the, the the failure or was this something where with this painted picture, you just decided this is the type of person that I want to be and these are the habits that I need and then move on? I mean, how did you... I guess to, to ask it a different way, you know, once you hit rock bottom, so to speak, right? How did you, with the painted picture, I mean, how did you turn it around and and start going in the right direction to where you felt like, okay, th this is what I got to do to get, I don't know what it is, but this is the, the right direction. Yeah. I mean, well, one of the things is that in the app, like there's a saying from a, a good friend of mine that in the absence of clarity, take action. And that's the one thing is when you're in transition, you know, there's a saying that when one door closes, another one opens, but it sucks being stuck in the hallway. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. for me, just being able to move towards something after being so just sedentary after mastermind, after my first business, because um, you start building up like those fears again, all that kind of stuff. When I was successful in my first business, I'd have aspiring entrepreneurs or new entrepreneurs come to me and ask me questions like, you know, I really want to start my own business, but I'm scared. And I'm like, you know, grow some, you know, yeah. man, man parts and just do it. It's not that <laughs> difficult. Right. But when I ended up a quarter million dollars in debt, um, I had all those fears come back of oh, the fear of being rejected of what are people going to think? I when I probably, when I knew I was doing mastermind talks and I was ready to launch it, I procrastinated probably for about two weeks before I posted it to, to Facebook. Um, to let other people know because I'm like, you know, once I post it, it's it's real. You know what I mean? Like yeah. I definitely have to do it. So, yeah, it was just kind of I, like I said, I didn't know Mastermind Talks would, would be my business of the future. I just saw it as an opportunity and I wasn't doing anything else at the time. And I knew connecting with entrepreneurs was something I enjoyed. Um, now I've been able to you know, monetize that and create an actual business out of it. Um, but it wasn't necessarily always, always like that. But as far as like the rituals, like I, now I'm very kind of, I have look like, kind of what you touched on. I'm very, I have very strong rituals, very strong habits and that kind of stuff. And I think there's probably two things that, that contribute to that. One is obviously hitting rock bottom for me. One of the biggest parts of that, of turning things around, cause you, you feel like, so I was obviously, I was unhappy at the time. When I was quarter million dollars in debt, had no business, all that kind of stuff, I was unhappy uh, for several reasons. But um, one of the things I was struggling with was I was rent resenting my daughter. And she was five months old at the time. And uh, I'm very clear as to why I'm an entrepreneur so that I can have full control of my time, full control of <laughs> my destiny, all that kind of stuff. And up until that point, I was living like, you know, the whole four-hour work week. I had full control of my time. Yeah. And then when my daughter came on the scene, 
I lost all control and I'm like, this is, this is miserable. I'm going to have to figure out how to get through this. So I started doing research on happiness and one of the pillars of happiness is perceived control. So I was like, well, I can, I can bank on not having control between the hours of 8 a.m. and 7 p.m., which is the hour she was awake. But what I can control is the time before that or the time after that. And I started implementing very strong morning rituals. So I'd start waking up at 4 a.m. and would produce as much work as possible between the hours of 4 a.m. and 8 a.m. And that gave me that sense of control back. And then I started building on that momentum. Okay, so, and, so stop there for a second. Yeah, where, yeah. Where, what time were you waking up? I was waking up at four. No, I mean before that. Oh, before I was probably I've always been a relative like a morning person, so I was probably waking up like six thirty. So was that? Did you just decide like you know what four this this is this is how I'm doing it and just boom like cold turkey? Yeah, well, <laughs> it's uh, I'm trying to remember back now because <laughs> obviously I had a five my, she was five months old, so my sleep was all messed up. Right, right. Um, and I was trying to go back to the gym at the time, so I'd wake up at like three fifteen. <laughs> I, it was it was bananas like it was yeah so I don't even I don't remember all I know is I started waking up at 4 a.m. and I think it was a pretty easy transition for me because I it didn't take long for me to get addicted to being able to control something again yeah, yeah. Um, because and then you know that now there's a ton of science behind it and there's you know willpower fatigue and decision making fatigue and the, the importance of small wins like now I'm actually trying to do a podcast episode for my own podcast about morning rituals yeah and I'm having a ridiculous time just trying to framework everything because there's so there's so many benefits there's so much science behind it now um just trying to pack all that into an episode is, is close to impossible but uh they're incredibly incredibly valuable yeah so so um gosh i, I just completely derailed your train of thought you're like humming there and i'm like oh wait let me, <laughs> let, me, let me chime in and screw this up no no um, no, no yeah so i mean morning rituals was, was a was a really really big thing to help things get back on track and back to the important like rituals and stuff like that i wasn't into that before but that was it and then now one of my biggest kind of motivators to for personal growth because I, I really do focus on personal growth quite a bit and awareness is really my daughter and as you know right I mean when you have kids they replicate everything you do and it's a huge responsibility to know that what I mean the standards I set and what I expect I accept from people and that kind of stuff becomes the software that my daughter will operate from so those two kind of things played hand in hand as far as making me very focused on uh, just like personal growth and personal awareness and that kind of stuff. God, that's so good. Um, so let me ask you, what, what time do you, what time do you crash out at night? So back then, uh, I was out by like nine, 9 PM and my wife hated me. I mean, she still hates me for going to bed. <laughs> like we're polar opposites on that front. She'll, she'll go to bed at like 1 AM. And, uh, I, yeah, right now. So now I'm actually, so I'm kind of, kind of going against the grain because I have different priorities right now. Uh, but now I wake up later. But I did the four in the morning for about a year. Um, and then after that, I've been still early morning, like 5 a.m., that kind of stuff. And now I'm switching things up a little bit for different reasons. But uh, morning rituals still apply no matter what time you wake up. Yeah. So, so do you think, you know, because you're, you're obviously, you know, big on this. And it's interesting because when I, when I first discovered kind of what you were doing, it, it reminded me so much of – you know, just kind of how Tim Ferriss, and I know he's a friend of yours, go, goes about when you read his books. I mean, he's very much into like this, almost like this self-experimentation, right? Um, and it's one of those things where I think there's something to that. When you do these things where it's almost like I'm I'm in control of my subconscious here. I'm, you know, I'm moving in the right direction because it's so easy just to, when that alarm goes off or, you know, if someone's trying to get fit or whatever, just to kind of go to that default of, yeah, yeah, tomorrow. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Well, it's at the end of the day, like willpower is a muscle, right? I mean, and that's, I mean, willpower is what willpower or motivation and what is what gets you going, but habit, oh, sorry, will willpower or motivation is what starts you, but habit is what gets you going, like keeps you going uh, to a degree. And I do a lot of stuff. Um, like none of my, like my days aren't all perfect. Um, but for the most part, I mean, they, they, they're, they're pretty good. They're pretty much in alignment, but I do stuff, you know, like I do those cold showers. I think we talked about, um, not, I mean, there's huge, you know, health benefits for it, but for me, it's something I don't want to do on a daily basis because nobody wakes up in the morning and says, I want to do a cold shower, but to do something <laughs> that I don't want to do and still do it on a daily basis starts to show your unconscious who's in charge and really helps kind of build that willpower as a muscle. Because they've proven in science uh, with stuff like the marshmallow test at Stanford and stuff like that, that willpower is a muscle and can be built or can atrophy. 
It's interesting. Yeah, I mean, it, it really, God, I mean, there's so much to that that I think, you know, as time goes on, the science behind all of that stuff is, you know, you can already kind of sense the evolution of it all. And, and uh, I just think, you know, years and years from now, people are going to realize what a tremendous impact that that type of stuff has on an individual's life and decision making and all that jazz. Oh, absolutely. Uh, there's no doubt about it. But so w- when you were coming out of it, and, and I know you've, you've said this before, I think it's a Porter Gale quote, but you, your network is your net worth. Yeah. <laughs> and, and you're kind of living that now. And do you think you could have picked yourself up had you not had that little bit of kind of network equity in advance? Not at all. I mean, and and the reason for that is uh, I didn't I didn't touch on this part of the story, but because I just want to be respectful of, of of time and I want to leave uh, space for conversation. But when I when I uh, struck the deal with Tim, yeah. So how that happened was I was waking up at four in the morning at the time, like I said, and um, Tim had just posted this blog post on his blog, and Tim is by far one of the best book marketers I know. His book, The 4-Hour Chef, was banned from all the Barnes & Noble's bookstores in the United States. And they found this out like nine days before the launch or two weeks before the launch. And the reason for that is because he was the first uh, first author to get published through Amazon. Yeah. First big name author. And Barnes & Noble, obviously, they're losing, you know, traction by the day. And they're like, well, we're going to make an example of him uh, trying to show that, you know, if you're not through Barnes & Noble, you can't be a bestseller type thing. So they banned him from 1,100 bookstores. That's a huge deal. So what Tim did uh, to kind of make up for the lost sales was he did these book bundles. And if you bought 10 books, you'd get this. If you bought 25 books, you'd get that. If you bought 100 books, you'd get a webinar, whatever the case may be. He had this Hail Mary package that if you bought 4,000 books, he'd do two speaking engagements. (laughs) And I saw that, and I actually thought of a friend of mine who put on these huge events in Canada, like two, 3,000 people, has people like Seth Godin and Malcolm Gladwell and all these people speak. And I'm like, this is a great opportunity for him because Tim doesn't speak that often, and he's never spoken in Canada. Um, and he can easily move the books because he has a couple thousand people at, show up as, at his event. So I emailed him, and the minute I click send on that email, I'm like, you know what? This is a great opportunity for anybody because it's safe to say that it, it was $84,000. And I'm like, it's safe to say that in two major metropolitan cities, you can get 42 people to spend $1,000 to spend an hour with Tim. I'm like, yeah. that's the worst case scenario. Plus, you get 4,000 books and all that kind of stuff. So I ended up emailing Tim directly and I'm like, you know what, I'll take the package. And he replied right away. And he's like, cool, we'll talk about it tomorrow. He was, he was, he was going to sleep. <laughs> he was going to sleep at that time. And then, um, and then, yeah, so I actually had to raise $84,000 within the next day, day and a half. It was really time sensitive. And, um, because this book order had to go through before the book was, was, was officially launched. So I had to raise $84,000. I've never raised a penny in my life. I've never, I had this limiting belief from what, from childhood, you know, that my father gave me, like, we used to work like dogs. He had a landscaping business. And if you were, we'd work in the sun, I was like seven or eight. <laughs> and he's like, you know, if you're thirsty, like if somebody gives you water or offers you water and you're thirsty, you don't take it. Like right. you do everything on your own. And so I had to overcome that limiting belief. And I called three friends of mine and I said, listen, I have this opportunity to buy these 4,000 books. It comes with two speaking engagements. I don't know what I'm going to do with it per se, but I think it's a great opportunity. Um, you know, would you be willing to invest? And the, and the one first guy's like, I'd, I'd love to talk like the numbers and stuff like that. And I'm like, I don't have time for numbers right now. So I moved on <laughs> to the next guy. The second guy, uh, the second and third guy both were willing to front me the money. Uh, one of them wanted to talk about like building a business out of it together. And the other guy's just like, here's the money, pay me back whenever. Um, and at that point in time, I realized two things. One is that you never know the value of your network until you really need it. And the second thing is that when you hit rock bottom, you'll be left with two things. One is your word and the integrity of your word. And the second thing is your network. And you should always invest in your network and you should never tarnish your word. Um, because that's what they invested in at the time. When I, I asked, I followed up with a guy who lent me the money three three months later. And I'm like, you know, <laughs> this business idea was only a few hours old. I was in survival mode as far as a mindset as an entrepreneur. I'm trying to provide for my family uh, and that kind of stuff. Like, why did you lend me $84,000? And he's like, well, I was investing in, I wasn't investing in the business. I was investing in you. And that's why like integrity has been a big thing for me ever since that uh, and relationship building and networking and all that kind of jazz has been, you know, a huge part of my life ever since. Man, that's, that, what, what a great story. 
You know, I mean, just just to have that, and, and you know, I mean, entrepreneurs love that type of stuff. But it it really is one of those things where you know, when you pulled the trigger on that, was it just kind of instinctual survival mode, or were you kind of like, uh, you know, I mean, it just seems you've never put on an event before. You're about to buy, you know, what what was that for eighty thousand dollars worth of books? Eighty four, yeah. And and so, you know, at the time, I mean, are you thinking like? I just got, I mean, was it almost subconscious? Like, I just have to make this happen. So the, the funny thing is, is in my last, because I've had been asked this question a few times. And I mean, yeah, a lot of people think it's crazy. They're like, what's the thought process? I'm like, I don't know. Uh, but one thing I can link back to is in my last business. The reason we grew so, so quickly, significantly quicker than the competition. I mean, we were, there was guys in our industry that were in the business for 20, 25 years. And we, we outgrew them uh, in no time. The reason for that is because I always – there's something called eustress. And eustress is basically kind of extending yourself outside your comfort zone um, and which forces you to grow to a degree, right? So it's like useful stress. And every time I've stretched myself in business, I've always found a way to follow through and make it work. And kind of linking back to that quote in the absence of clarity, take action – um, I wasn't taking action on anything really all at the time. And this was just that Hail Mary that I felt like I could I could make work. And at the worst, in the worst case scenario, I could probably sell off the package and split it to two friends who are in the event space or or something like that. So I felt like I wasn't 120% committed, committed to it. Um, so there was a little bit of a backup plan. But again, the biggest thing for me was I knew that every time I threw that Hail Mary historically, I've always found a way to follow through. Yeah, no, I mean, and, and look what's happened. I mean, it's just a, it's a, it's a beautiful thing to watch and, you know, uh, God, it's, it's been so much fun, you know, as soon as I kind of <laughs> figure out who, who, who you were and, and, you know, we had the whole EO connection I've, I've been watching and it, it just is, I'm so happy for, for you and, and, I what, appreciate it. and what's happening. It's just, um, God, I mean, it, it just is a lot of fun to watch and not only that, but it's just a really awesome idea that it'd be interesting to see how you, how you grow it or expand it because, um, you know, I know there's a, a desperate need out there for, for what you're doing. I mean, you know, being in the entrepreneurs organization, we're kind of, you know, we've been fortunate at least, you know, in that they always put on, you know, quality events and stuff like that. But most people don't have that. Sure. Yeah. No. Yeah. And this is uh, it's it's one of those things like uh, events have always been a, a big thing for me as far as relationship building. And I get people who come up to me who are not eo caliber type thing so they're not in the seven figures of the business and that kind of stuff and they're like well you know i want to you know build a network or i want to uh connect with like-minded people where do i find them and i'm like oh they're out there just look around but it's <laughs> if you're a startup guy it's actually not that easy unless you're like in the tech space or something like that but yeah. i mean our audience is kind of that eo caliber but it's like I don't know. For me personally, again, this is nothing bad against EO, but if there's 10,000 members, you're not going to jive with all of them. I probably really jive with like 15% of the people in our, our chapter, in our membership. Um, like just really, really jive. Like people who are, they're, they have a, you know, they're, they're not, they're focused on, so we have a saying that an entrepreneur is somebody who goes from building, uh, an entrepreneur is somebody who goes from uh, working in their business to on their business, but there's yeah. a second tier of entrepreneur that goes from working on their business to working on themselves. And that's who we put in the room. Love so it. that can be uh, an EO guy at five million. That could be a YPO guy at fifty million a year, or it could be somebody you know who's a startup who has their their head on right. Um, so we we judge people based on who they are and what they stand for, not their revenue numbers. Yeah, and, and I mean that's. I mean, it's so awesome, especially today with all the innovation. I mean, we were talking about before the show just how revenue is, is you know, guys like to beat their chest, guys and gals, about, you know, revenue <laughs> numbers. But, you know, truth be told, it's like, you know, how much do you get to keep at the end of the day? And, you know, there's guys out there with $200,000 businesses that are making more than guys with $20 million businesses, you know. 100%. Yeah, absolutely. So it's a it's an interesting thing. So, you know, when I look back at, at, on your journey and I guess, you know um, – I guess as you look back on it, I mean, from a habit standpoint, yeah, uh, creating great habits and having that network, I think, you know, is that really what kind of put you on a new trajectory and just got you on course? Yeah. I mean, I think uh, setting up habits and rituals uh, helped me get traction where I didn't have traction before, where I felt like I was spinning. Um, that helped there. And then my network has always helped me immensely. Um, yeah. It's one of those things like, 
I'm a firm believer that all problems can be solved with the right network. And it's just, it's to you to actually reach out to your network. <laughs> like I, so many times I'll be stuck on something and I'll put it out to Facebook and or any kind of social platform and I'll get an answer within minutes or I'll get the connection. I, I've, I had a request. I'm like, does anybody know this astronaut? Like really like Hail, <laughs> Hail Mary. And I had an intro. I had an intro within like a day. Uh, yesterday I had a really big important meeting four hours before the meeting I posted to Facebook that I was sick and I just needed something to hold me over the meeting anybody have any any tips I had 37 comments and I had one person at the end of the 37 comments he's like people announce they're having a baby don't get this many comments <laughs> so I mean I just I built an incredible network and it's it I'm I mean, one of my secret sauces, and I'll, I'll leave this with your audience, uh, or no, we'll keep going, but I just want to really put this nugget uh, in for your audience, is everyone, everybody wants to be connected with the Richard Bransons of the world. Everybody wants to be connected with the Tim Ferrisses and that kind of stuff. My model uh, is, although I am connected with some big name people, my model is that amazing people become increasingly amazing over time. So I see myself as a talent scout. And... You know, that could be somebody who's that 17 year old kid who's really promising, or somebody who, you know, is in corporate world who you just know would, would do really, really well in entrepreneurship. And it doesn't even have to be that they're an entrepreneur. Maybe it's just an amazing person. But for me, that's been one of the biggest payoffs because there's so much noise. If you want to be friends with the Tim Ferriss, there's so much noise there. He doesn't need any more friends. Like it's really hard <laughs> yeah. to, to become friends with somebody like that. But it's really easy to be able to lift somebody up. And a great example of this is, is Sully Brakes. He spoke at our first mastermind talks event he did a youtube video which is a spoken word um on education and i saw it within the first like couple days that he launched it. it didn't have much traction but it was a great message and i reached out to him i said you know what and he was nobody and i said you know would you like to to, to speak at mastermind talks like i just have this gut feeling you're gonna be fantastic and he was really nervous never spoke in front of a, an audience like that it was this kid from uk um, well, by the time Mastermind Talks happened, that one single video had like three, four million views. Wow. And he was doing really, really well. At Mastermind Talks, he connected with a bunch of great entrepreneurs who wanted to help him, who've been helping him kind of amplify his efforts. Since then, he's connected with like Will Smith and all these people. And now we're like close friends. And I haven't had to put a ton of effort into the relationship, but we'll be friends forever. Um, and that's really one thing I, I, that people get wrong when it comes to relationship building is they start they judge people based on where they are. Um, and I just have a different approach where I really kind of try to pride myself on being a talent scout and being able to kind of spot that talent and investing in them uh, as much as possible. How people invest in business is how I invest in people, basically. Dude, that's awesome. So no, one more question, then I'm gonna let you fly because I've, I've I'm, I'm in no, yeah, I'm in no rush, but please, right. yeah, whatever you want to do. Well, I guess l let me know, like when when you uh, okay, so years from now, I mean, you're doing something incredible right now that is really, I think, making an impact, and and you've got to love the the new direction that you're in. But when you look back, you know, years from now, uh, Jason, what, how do you hope you will have made your mark, man? That's funny. I ask that question to a lot of people and, and people don't throw it back at me. <laughs> um, honestly, it's uh, my biggest thing. I, and this is sounds so stupid, but I just picture myself being on like my deathbed and I want, you know, friends there. I want like obviously that recognition would be great and all that kind of stuff. But I just I just want my daughter and my wife to say they were proud of me. And as stupid as that sounds. Um, that's really, that's a huge driver for me unconsciously is getting their, their approval on that level to know that I left a big enough legacy that I, I mattered, um, and that they're, they're proud of me. Um, and that actually stems, this is, this is going deep and off the deep end a little bit, but I mean, a lot, I, I facilitate retreats. So very similar to EO form, I do these retreats on a quarterly basis with a group of entrepreneurs. And one of the underlining themes that we seem to all share in common is this kind of self worth? Mm -hmm. um, you know, the reason we build these big businesses and all this kind of stuff is we're we're seeking approval uh, or the okay from somebody. And for me, I didn't realize it up until recently. It was actually my father. Um, I was driving my car one day, and uh, it's probably about six months ago. And for some reason, he popped into my head, and and the the words that he was proud of me popped into my head, and I broke into tears. Mm. And I was like, this is, this is ridiculous, but there's something here. Like there's, I, I don't know why I'm reacting like this, but there's something here. And 
since then, I just have been very conscious of that and my need for like approval and significance and all that kind of stuff and how it stems from that and how much that one, you know, my father's never said he's proud of me because he's very much, you know, you know, tough guy and all that kind of stuff because he's never said that it's been a huge driver for me as far as like, you know, building my business and all this flashy stuff because I was hoping that all that kind of stuff, that's what I was seeking in the end. And so many of us, whether you're an entrepreneur or not, have that. We're just we're seeking that that approval from somebody who's who you know has a huge influencer in our life. And uh, I, I now that I'm aware of it, I'm not. I don't need it from him as much anymore, or if at all. Uh, but at the end of the day, we all have a deep desire for significance, and we all have a deep desire for approval from the ones we love and stuff like that. And for me, when I think about it, it's just my my daughter and my wife <laughs> saying they're proud of me, as stupid as that sounds. Yeah, dude, it, it that's man, that's awesome. And, and I mean, you know, it may sound a little strange uh, coming from me, but you know, I, I also, man, I'm I'm proud of you, man. It's um, God, because I, I know where you're coming from. I mean, having tanked the business, it's it's not easy to get back up on your feet and mm. particularly go in a direction that that means something to you. Yeah, and, and just go for it. And I think you know what you've accomplished in, in where you're going is. Um, you know, it's almost like like you talked about. You know, the, the young kid from the UK. I mean, you can just kind of see this thing evolving, not not because you know there's just an authenticity that that you can feel from people that yeah you know, I, I get from you, and it's just um, you know I don't I don't know how to say it. It's just, it's just refreshing, man. It it really is. Oh, I really appreciate it, man. I really do. But uh, yeah, well, I, I hope everybody got something from this, uh, <laughs> and I'm going to redirect everybody. I mean, I, I've been you know listening to the podcast, uh, gosh, since you started, it's it's fantastic, and I know with with your network and and what you're doing with Mastermind Talks, it's only going to get better. So I'll make sure and drive everybody there. But if people want to reach out to you or, or learn more, um, where should they go, Jason? Yeah, I mean, the podcast is great. We have a community, a uh, free community, which is mmtcommunity.com, which you can join there. It's free, and then you, know, you can get access to me on there. I'm, I'm really active on there, answering questions and giving away free stuff. Um, and then also on Twitter, at Jason Gaynard uh, is a great way to reach out to me as well. Awesome, man. Well, I appreciate you coming on, and uh, best of luck. We'll definitely be watching, and, and I'll be in touch for sure, Jason. Dude, I appreciate you having me on. Thanks, brother. Thanks, man. All right, guys, that's it for another edition of Make Your Mark. How awesome was that? Jason, thanks so much for taking the time to share your story with the audience. Man, you know, I love you out there. What you're doing is remarkable. Um, that's about all I can say. I mean, it just really, I'm, I'm impressed. You know, this guy is doing really, really cool things. So check out Mastermind Talks. I'll have all the links in the show notes at makeyourmark.com slash 14. His podcast is one of my favorites love what he's doing his guests are awesome and of course he plays some of the mastermind talks as well and then he has a community um on facebook the mmt community i'll have a link as well in the show notes i'm in there there's a lot of really cool people in there um he's just doing great things man so thanks for everything jason thank you guys for listening and as always if you can go to um itunes download the episode leave me some feedback it would be greatly appreciated and that's the only reason the only way rather that i really spread the word so uh, if you can help me out there, that'd be awesome. And we'll keep bringing you great guests and, uh, yeah, hopefully inspiring you. So with that said, guys, I'm out of here. My name is Steve Gum, and I already said it, but I'm out of here. <laughs>